everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our book club. I am Miss Maka. And I am Mr. Daryl. And today we are going to talk about a classic from the 19th century, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. By Oscar Wilde. But before we look at the book itself, definitely we'll have to look at our agenda. Traditionally, we start with vocabulary parts, then we continue our uh, program about the author, uh, then we will talk about the story in short, the summary of the story. Indeed, and then we go to characters who are the moving parts of a story that push the story forward. Uh, then we look at the setting, always good to look at the setting for various reasons. You get the context well when you look at the setting. And then we have to look at the main themes of the story, because without the main themes, you can't understand what the author was trying to tell you, yes. uh, with what message he was trying to give you. Of course. And uh, as usual, we'll conclude the whole program and give you uh, homework. Uh, very good. And I'm looking forward to the homework today. Me too. Let's begin with the vocabulary list of the day, as we mm -hmm. always do. We have eight words that we want you to focus on, and uh, here they are. The first word is uh, portrait, portrait, portrait. Mm -hmm. And this is when you uh, sit for a painting that's taken of you, like it can be uh, the upper body, and it was quite a popular form in the 19th century and early 20th century before cameras came in. Mm -hmm. Portrait. Next, we have immoral, uh, an adjective, immoral. And this is when uh, something is morally wrong, uh, it should not be done, it goes against human nature. Amoraluri, usneo. We have a slightly unusual verb after, to garner. To garner is to gather, in other words, uh, to collect or obtain a large amount of something useful or important. This is to garner. Yes, mumaragepa, shenachwa. Next, we have conventional. Uh, conventional. This is something traditional or accepted rather than something new or different. Yes. Um, Our next word is to exploit, to exploit. Uh, this is to, to treat someone unfairly in order to get the benefits for yourself. Yes, exploitation. Next, we have rumor, uh, rumor, rumor. This is unofficial information that may or may not be true about someone or something. Chori. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, next, we have disgusting. Disgusting. Mm -hmm. That's how you should say it too, disgusting. Mm. Uh, this is something that's extremely unpleasant and that you do not want to uh, experience. Yes. Uh, in Georgian, it sounds like tzazizgari, uzneo. That also sounds disgusting yes, to my, yeah. my ear. And last, we have to worship. To worship, uh, this is a more positive word. It's the feeling of love and respect for something uh, higher than yourself. Um, okay, now uh, we do have a question, a vocabulary word mm -hmm. question. And this is, anyone can answer here, how can spreading rumors, as we talked about, uh, about a person, be dangerous? In my opinion, it can be very dangerous and harmful because it can destroy a person's reputation. That's exactly what happens when you spread false information about people. You destroy reputations. Yeah, so we should always remember not to ever spread rumors, right? And that connects to our story very well because that mm -hmm. is what our story uh, deals with. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's move on to the author. Uh, the Irish author, Oscar Wilde, born in 1854 uh, in Dublin. He was an author, he was a playwright, a poet. Uh, he had a bit of a scandalous reputation. Uh, his story is not very happy or it doesn't end happily. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a popular literary figure in his time in Victorian England. Um, and after graduating Oxford University, he lectured 
as a poet and an art critic. It's in 1891, so the last decade of the 19th century, that he published The Picture of Dorian Gray, uh, and it's his only novel. And it was considered to be immoral, immoral by Victorian standards, mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of his troubles began. He was perceived as an immoral writer, and um, he did write a lot of comedies that were well received, though. So, yes. Upon graduating from Oxford, he moved to London to live with his uh, friend. Uh, that's where he started to focus on his writing, um, writing skills generally and writing poetry. Beginning in 1888, Wilde entered a seven year of furious creativity. So uh, that is the period when he created his most famous um, piece of work. Uh, this is Portrait of Dorian Gray. He published his first and uh, his only one, this Portrait of Dorian Gray. And uh, like a true 19th century author, he dies right at the end of it, uh, in the year 1900, uh, at the age of 46, so quite young. Um, he is remembered since that time mm -hmm. as a very witty, that means like quick uh, and sharp thinking uh, comic talent. Uh, and undeniably beautiful works, whether it's the poetry, whether it's the, the, the plays that he wrote, and this novel that we're discussing today. Uh, and uh, he really has produced some of the masterpieces of Victorian uh, literature. Yes. So, as we already mentioned, uh, we said that uh, this Oscar Wilde entered to his furious creative period, yeah? Furiously creative. So I want to ask to our audience, what does it mean when a writer is being furiously creative? It means that his brain is working at full capacity. Yes, and uh, when your brain is working, it means you're creating something special, right? I wish my brain worked like that <laughs> at exam time. But... Let's wait for our furious crea creative <laughs> period. <laughs> so. Okay. Let's move on to the summary. Akhla Visaubrept Tignis Shinarse. In the house of Lady Brandon, a well known uh, artist, um, Basil Hallward, uh, meets Dorian Gray. He is really attracted by his uh, beauty. Uh, so he really likes him uh, as a model. So he really uh, wants to paint him and that's uh, how he starts his portrait. So Lord Henry, who is a friend of the artist, uh, loves scandals. Basil does not really want to meet Lord Henry, uh, to introduce Lord Henry to uh, Dorian Gray. Uh, because he knows that he would be a bad influence on a young uh, man. Um, so, Basil's fears are well founded because before the end of the first conversation, Lord Henry upsets Dorian with a speech that beauty and youth will fade as time goes by, which mm -hmm. true, true enough. Uh, Dorian curses his portrait, which he believes one day will remind him of the beauty that he would, will have lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and he suddenly wishes that the portrait would age instead of himself. Uh, and that he would stay forever young, and that is precisely what happened. Yes. Over the next few weeks, uh, Lord Henry's influence on Dorian Gray actually grows stronger. So he starts to live a life dedicated to the pursuit of pleasure. So although he falls in love with an artist, um, and although this is a true love, he still cruelly breaks uh, his engagement with her. So when he gets home, he sees that the painting has changed. And he's frightened by this because he realizes for the first time that the painting is aging and he might not be. He hides this uh, painting in the corner of the room so that no one can find it uh, and no one can see what's happening here. Sybil, Dorian's fiance, uh, kills herself after Dorian breaks up with her. Uh, and Dorian sinks himself uh, even deeper into the life of corruption and sin. He lives a life devoted uh, to gaming, new experiences and sensations with no regard for conventional standards of morality or the consequences of his action, actions. Mm -hmm. 18 years pass 
uh, Dorian's reputation suffers in this time. Uh, rumors spread about his scandalous exploits. So it's not exactly rumors, he is doing scandalous uh, exploits. Mm -hmm. During this time, the portrait has changed quite a lot. Uh, it has aged uh, very, very much, whereas Dorian remains um, pure looking. And Hallward, noticing this, it horrified, becomes horrified and begs him to repent. Now, Dorian claims that it is self-punishment and he kills Basil in a fit of rage. Yes, and you know, uh, Dorian forgets about the fact that it is never late to regret or to somehow do some better things, okay? So, of course, the ending is really interesting. You should definitely read this book uh, for, uh, to understand what is it about. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have a question for our audience, um, and maybe you can help us with an answer. Is it always true that being beautiful means being a good person? No, from Dorian Gray we see that the beauty made him evil. Well, that was a good answer. Um, it is true, I think, that something beautiful does not always mean that it's good. Mm -hmm. I also have a question. Do you think a person like Dorian Gray would ever regret his life choice? No, because at one, at one point when Basil asks um, uh, and begs to regret his decisions, um, Dorian uh, claims that it's too late for uh, self-punishment. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the characters. Um, remember, these are the moving parts of the story. Yes. They move us from point A, the beginning, to the, to the end, uh, and they are how the story is told. Mm -hmm. uh, why not begin with Dorian Gray himself, um, our protagonist. He is presented as a young, pure, and beautiful uh, uh, man when the novel opens, and it's that image that Basil Hallward wants to capture on uh, paint, on the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, he may be beautiful, Dorian, but he is empty as well. He's uh, self-obsessed, self-centered, destructive as well. Mm -hmm. So beauty with evil characteristics inside. Uh, Oscar Wilde creates a complicated picture of, uh, of a, maybe a new type of person for the 19th century. The portrait he paints of Dorian is actually quite disgusting. Yes, uh, but uh, you know, this man, Dorian, may be physically lovely, but he leaves a trail of broken hearts, uh, terrible reputation, and even dead bodies behind him. Dorian's name is also very important, but arguable, of course. As we see, Oscar Wilde gave him a surname, Grey. So uh, that suggests that, that he is morally uh, neither black or, nor white. Or we can also um, think so that he could be either black or white. So it depends how you look at this. Okay, so he's neither, but he could be both. Yes, he could be both. <clears throat> and his first name also might have possible uh, meanings. The Dorians, that name Dorian, comes from Greek, uh, from Greek history. Mm -hmm. and Doris was a, uh, one of the sea gods of Greek mythology, which would be connected to Dorian's beautiful mother, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and his own, his own supernatural beauty. It's presented as otherworldly, like not normal level of beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, and in French, uh, d'or would mean of gold or golden, which would also describe Dorian's kind of great beauty. So there's a lot of... Yeah. Uh, symbolism thrown into this. Of course, so if, if we combine, we can say like black and white gold or something, yes. Now let's look at our second character, Basil. So Basil is the second of the four characters uh, at the heart of this novel. Uh, Basil is a major man. He is an artist who is quite conventional. He's concerned with reputation and good character. Uh, but also with uh, capturing and creating beauty. Yes, in fact, um, <clears throat> Oscar Wilde begins the novel with a preface, and it says, the artist is the creator of beautiful things. 
And that is somewhat the case here. Basil does create a beautiful portrait of Dorian, mm -hmm. but what good is it? That is the question. Yes, it is a beautiful part uh, because Basil lets his um, worship of Dorian become a painting. Uh, and it doesn't remain beautiful. The painting does not remain beautiful itself. So only Dorian does. Does this mean that Basil created Dorian? Uh, it does, in part. Uh, he certainly helps to establish Dorian's supernatural uh, status. However, it is up to another character to, to bring Dorian's fully into being uh, Henry Wotton. And it is Henry Wat Wotton that I will talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, he's cynical. Uh, he's glamorous as well. He's a bit of a dangerous uh, person. He lives with his life on display to the world for pleasure and he claims entirely by himself so he's made himself uh, this is now this is something new in 19th century you didn't have these kinds of characters he's a bit of like almost like a bohemian I mean very much like a bohemian uh, in that sense uh, Henry explains beauty art and life uh, in very like high terms in ways that changes uh, Dorian and uh, so Basil might have been the start but it's Henry that it pushes him over to another level. Yes, a great influencer, I would say. <laughs> yeah. uh, about the three characters, um, Oscar Wilde once wrote that um, Basil is uh, what I think I am. Lord Henry is what people think that I am. And Dorian is a person who I would like to be. So in other ages, perhaps. That's a good uh, way of looking at it. Okay. Yes. We have one more character, mm -hmm. uh, Sybil Vane, Sybil Vane. Well, her very name is symbolic. If you look at that name, uh, in ancient Greece, again, uh, Sybils were oracles at holy sites. So that means they would tell the future. They would predict the future. They, would, mm -hmm. uh, they had magical powers as well. Uh, and <coughs> Sybil is an actress. Her last name as well has various meanings. Uh, she's very beautiful in the, in the novel. Mm -hmm and it would be appropriate for her to be vain, if you know the English word vain, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of uh, thinking highly of oneself. Mm -hmm. But she's not. Instead, she sadly lives in vain, which is a phrasal verb, kind of play on, on the word. So now, now it means someone who lives their life with no uh, purpose, uselessly in, in a way. And she dies young as a result of her naiveness and complex relation with art. Yes, she is poor and beautiful. Uh, she's an actress, um, and we can see that she's trying to escape her reality uh, while working and while acting. So after she met Dorian, she actually quits uh, her, her profession. Um, and that explains it because uh, she has no longer to escape the reality because she feels so well with Dorian. But you know, uh, as you said, that um, she, there were some creatures that would predict a uh, future, right? She also felt that Dorian was in a wrong way, so uh, she was kind of warning him. Uh, but of course, Dorian didn't uh, really listen to her. But also, the readers might be interested why um, then why Basil is painting so well. What is he escaping from, right? Um, but, of course, it's up to you to answer the question. When you read the novels yourselves. Yes. Okay, well, now that we've uh, discussed this a little bit, the characters, mm -hmm. let's ask the audience a few questions about characters. Can we define Dorian's true nature as either good or evil? Well, he was evil because, as we see from the story, he made his own choice. That's an excellent point. It's, it's a person's choices that pushes them either in a good direction or in a bad direction. So yeah. it's the choices, responsibility, basically. Yeah, or we can say you are what you choose. <laughs> you are Something what like. you choose. Yeah, Very okay. Um, also, the second question to our lovely pupils. Who is the real victim of the book? I think it's a Basil because he's the only character who has a pure uh, intention. He loved Dorian's beauty so much that he wanted to capture it on canvas. Um, yes, 
That's a really nice point. Um, actually, Basil is the only character, I would say, who had really pure intentions and he really wanted to uh, put beauty of Dorian Gray on painting. That was all he wanted. Very good. Let's move on to the setting now. Um, as usual, we always discuss the when and the where's. Um, why don't you start with the when of the story? Yes, of course. So, the novel takes place in the late 19th century. Although the date is never mentioned in this book, when Oscar Wilde included the Yellow Book, a secret version of Rebors by J.K. Um, Haysman, uh, this is an indication of the period of time he was trying to describe. Uh, also, the contrast be between dull middle-class society and the scenes of the wealthy and corrupt upper classes makes Wilde's book all the more um, daring. I agree. We should look at the where of the story now. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is interesting because Oscar Wilde makes use of location to show psychological and personality uh, characteristics of uh, Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. Dorian moves freely between two major parts of London. He moves from the wealthy West End to the ruined East End. Mm -hmm. And in the West End, in the luxurious part of London, he has his home. Um, and there are gentlemen's clubs, uh, theaters, symphony halls. In the East End, uh, near the docks, Dorian uh, sneaks into uglier locations. Um, there's an opium den, a drug hall. Uh, and he indulges in drugs as well. So the two parts of London sort of showcase two parts of himself, mm -hmm. uh, within himself. Now, uh, in the West End, he's also a gentleman, he's fashionable, he's cultured, he's aristocratic. Uh, he's surrounded by fine culture, French cuisine and so on. And it's in the Eastern End that he escapes from that to uh, indulge in a more kind of a darker side of him. So. Yeah. Geography reflecting psychology. Yes, his character. Okay, let's um, ask a question to our audience. Is it important to have a good reputation in society? Yes, because it is very difficult to gain a good reputation. That's why we should take care of it. Wow, great answer. Yes. Well, I have another question as well. Do you agree that the two parts of London symbolize Dorian in the way that we described earlier. Yes, because from the book we can see that he has two natures. Definitely. Uh, there is that duality in the book, the, mm -hmm. the dual nature, the two-part nature of the book, and I think geography is connected to that. Yes, definitely. So it reflects on his personality maybe. As well, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we should move on to the main themes now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. We've chosen several themes to talk about, but there are many, many more themes mm -hmm. that are in this book. The one that we have chosen, the ones that we have chosen, are first of all, reputation versus character. Mm -hmm. um, now, this tale is very much about reputation. Uh, it's a story about others tell about a person, so everyone's gossiping about uh, Dorian. Uh, the things that he does, the things that he gets into. Mm -hmm. And the character turns out to be um, the person's real nature. And this is symbolized by the painting as well, the duality between the painting and the way Dorian uh, looks himself, um, the way he physically resembles. Uh, this book examines when the two things separate, what mm -hmm. happens. Uh, when reputation separates from character, you get some kind of uh, divide that doesn't work anymore. Once Dorian starts to behave badly, uh, many people start to hear the stories about him. And basically, his reputation precedes him, so it's not in step with him anymore, it goes ahead of him, and it, uh, and it sets people's opinions up about him. Uh, these stories are not good, and would ruin anyone else, mm -hmm. and come very close to ruining Dorian himself. However, uh, people who see Dorian, they actually reject all those stories because of his pleasing uh, physical appearance. They take the proof um, their own eyes offer uh, and they reject all those stories 
uh, no matter how obvious and often they are quite repeated. Let's ask a question to the audience and um, see what answers we get. Can art have a negative influence on artists and people? Uh, yes, because if the artist becomes too obsessed with his artistic ideas, he can influence others in a negative way too. Very good answer. Uh, there are so many examples of art having a negative influence on people throughout history. Definitely, of course. It's and also positive ones. It's a dangerous uh, job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Maka, I think it's time to wrap this up. Yes. So, uh, of course, the, the very first thing we did was talking about the author, Mr. Oscar Wilde. And then we talked about the summary, uh, about the beautiful looking man, uh, Dorian, whose beauty will uh, disappear over time. And the portrait that is painted of him ages instead of him, which uh, presents problems. Yes. Okay, then we talked about the characters. There are many interesting characters in the story. Of course, uh, this is Dorian Gray with his dual personality. Mr. Basil Howard, uh, who is the artist, the creator of the portrait. Um, of course, Lord Henry Watson, the influencer, and the young lady, Sybil Bain, who was the uh, girlfriend lover of um, Dorian Gray. Remember that the story happens in the 19th century in England using two sides of London, the West End and the East End. Mm -hmm, of course, and the uh, main themes we had, this was reputation versus character and art versus life. Good. Now one more time, let's go through the words from the vocabulary list at the beginning. I will say it in English and you can tell us the uh, translation. Mm -hmm. We had portrait, portrait. Portrait. We had immoral. Amoraluri. We had to garner. Shegroveba. We had to exploit. Exploitatia gamukeneba, ragazis shens sasargeblod. We had worship. Kagmerteba. Next was disgusting. Sazizgari. Next was a rumor. Chori. And we had conventional. And of course, our final uh, part of the program, Mr. Daryl, what about our homework? Yes, this is a way to get uh, audience members involved and we would like them to answer this question. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people always want to stay and look young? What are the things they do to stay young? Uh, give examples. Rogor mm Pikrot. -hmm. Ratom source halfs gamoi urebodnen mudam achal gazrdulat. Da ras hak etepen amistuis. Moi wanet magalitebi. We'd like these answers to be sent to us at the address on the screen. Velit tkuens davalebeps mittebul misamarze. And I think uh, after all this discussion with the audience members, with between ourselves, and hopefully with the audience at home, mm -hmm. it's time to say goodbye. Yes, I think that's all for today. So let's prepare for the next week. See you next week. Have a great week. Goodbye. Goodbye.